If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. As Majority Floor Leader, Senator Caleb Rowden is widely known as the traffic cop of the Missouri Senate, and the Columbia Republican has a good sense of what his chamber will be dealing with over the next few months. Rowden joins us on the latest edition of Politically Speaking to talk about what's ahead for the 2019 legislative session, so let's hit the music. This is Politically Speaking, the longest-running episodic podcast about Missouri politics. It's a little complicated in Bolivar because there is a Parsons family there. But we also knew that it was important to make sure that, that we got to where we needed to go. You know if you walk in a room and you're getting ready to make a decision and everybody in the room looks like you, you need to stop. And right now what happens in the United States Senate is as critical as anywhere else in the country. I really want the state to succeed. We want everybody to uh, know that we're all working together. I just worked hard to try to build my name where I didn't have the money. And welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, Jason Rosenbaum, a reporter with St. Louis Public Radio. Uh, Joining us via not only the magic of radio, but the magic of the Comrex FieldTap app. For the first time we've ever used this technology, so if it fails, uh, that's why. We have as our special guest from Jefferson City. Majority Floor Leader, Senator Caleb Robin. Thank you very much for coming back on the show. This is your third time on the program. We've never actually done a show face-to-face before. It, it, <laughs> it, 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 I mean, it, for all I know, that you're just like a, an algorithm or a hologram, and you're not an actual legislator. Well, if I some ne- days I wish that was true. Yeah, if I had never uh, met you in real life. But before we get into the, the, the meat and potatoes issues, for people that don't know what the Senate Majority Floor Leader does, I wanted you to take a couple minutes to explain its role and why it's important to the Senate process. Sure. So we, you know, I'm, I'm tasked with uh, the, the, the best really quick description I've heard is just the traffic cop for the Senate. So we have obviously any number of orders of business and things that we do every day. And, and so my office and, and my team orchestrates what that looks like. Obviously, that includes uh, a, a number of procedural things, but then also uh, obviously when we get into the heavy lifting part of session, uh, determining what bills come to the floor, uh, you know, the, the length of time and in many cases, how long we stay on a bill and, uh, you know, just trying to make sure that the place works, that the floor works, that, you know, if we if we're in the middle of a heated debate on a big issue and we feel like maybe there's an opportunity to uh, go offline and have a more substantive conversation about how we get to an outcome, then you know, sometimes the floor leader will go to the, the bill sponsor and say, hey, let's take this offline. We can, we can you know, maybe pass two or three more bills in the time that you're talking with uh, folks that you're working with. And so it's just kind of that, try, trying to always see the big picture of how we can keep the place going is, is really what it boils down to. Th- this may seem like a bizarre question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Uh, what would compel you to be a part of Senate leadership? Because unlike the House, <laughs> where the House leadership wields a lot of power and often has the majority of the caucus behind them, depending on the issue. As, as, as I'm sure you and our listeners know, the Senate is not nearly the same dynamic. Senators sure. have wildly different opinions on things. And oftentimes, like both parties kind of devolve in, into factions and occasionally fight each other as opposed as as well as fighting the, the various parties as parties. This seems like a really thankless and horrible job that you've decided (laughs) to run for. But if you could explain, like, what prompted you to go through this moment of temporary insanity, I I would appreciate an answer to that. Those are all good descriptors. I can't push back against much of any of them. But, you know, I think the what what I saw in my time in the House and then certainly uh, my first year in the Senate, my second year in the Senate last year was was, I think, uh, by all accounts, it was a tumultuous year, but but we got a lot done. Uh, I think Missourians and I think uh, the, the, the process is better when the Missouri Senate works, uh, when when the Missouri Senate is dysfunctional. And and uh, like you said, when we kind of devolve into just this this chamber of of uh, various silos of, of individuals and, and uh, groups, then, you know, ultimately, I think the dialogue suffers uh, what we what the end product on. 
uh, things that Missouri and sent us here for, I think that process suffers. And so I, I think a strength that I have always had is, is being pretty mild mannered, you know, not my temperament's not too high or low, uh, and, and have always really valued and tried really, really hard to build relationships with folks. And that those are all things that have served me well outside of, of, uh, the Capitol as well. But I think, it's it's something that serves well in this building, in this chamber, and and specifically in this position. I think even more than, uh, you know, being the president of the Senate, which uh, the, the, I think the responsibilities and kind of the demeanor and and mo of the president even is quite different than than that of the majority leader. And so I, I just thought my the strengths that I do have uh, I thought would would serve this chamber well, and and so that was part of the reason why. You know, once I, I actually had some people approach me, some upperclassmen who, who thought that I was uh, w- was ready to jump into the role. And, and uh, you know, doing it in year three of a Senate tenure is is, is unheard of. Uh, certainly pre-term limits, it, it was impossible. Post-term limits, it still was still pretty difficult. But um, they approached me. I thought about it and obviously ran the, ran the race and, and got enough votes. And, and here we are. Before we get into kind of the individual issues, I think it would be a good time to talk about the state budgetary situation. Um, it's it's kind of a complicated way of describing it, but basically when the last fiscal year ended, there was kind of an unexpected surge of money that couldn't be used in, I guess, FY 2018, I guess, and got carried over to 2019. Mm-hmm. And that that's kind of a, a good thing in this budget year because right. all that I've seen is that collections are, are way down from the previous year. And how concerned are you as a member of Senate leadership about this, especially considering everything we're going to be talking about after this? Sometimes it requires money. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I don't know that we, we're certainly – I don't know if concerned is the right word because we've we've continually had – conversations with budget folks uh, on our side in the house the governor's folks uh, you know folks at uh, Mizzou and other folks who, who kind of watch this process and you know I, I think the DOR issue has been been pretty widely covered uh, there are there were multiple issues that, that kind of converged to, to bring us to the place that we are you know there, I, I still don't talk to anybody no, nobody likes where we are and I think that there, there's kind of two separate conversations one is uh, critiquing uh, and making sure we don't ever get to where we are again where you know we, we are potentially going to see a lot of Missourians are going to have kind of un- unexpected tax bills and just uh, to explain on, for people on, that don't understand basically the Department of Revenue I guess calculated its withholding tables incorrectly after well, the there, Basically. Yeah, there were two issues. One, the, the withholding table uh, issue was actually, I think, in the grand scheme of things, is a little bit smaller in terms of the impact on the budget. The bigger issue was for, for years and years and years, a lot of people have uh, have have o- over uh, claimed on a on a on a, a tax form so that they basically would would kind of rig the system and get a, a bigger return at the end of the year. But because of the federal tax bill now that that process uh, will not reap the benefits that it would have prior because some of those exemptions uh, and some of those things that you were claim that you could claim got taken away. And mm-hmm. so so you've got you, you got two things and we'll find out, you know, by by the end of the fiscal year, we'll find out uh, if the entire gap of, as far as the, the current budget hole that we're in is closed or not and, and kind of what the bigger of the two issues were. Uh, but it, it's one of those things that that we certainly I think we can learn from the process. Uh, but we are where we are, and so now my my advice and and my goal has been uh, let's look forward. Let's make sure that if there are uh, issues that need to be addressed in how this kind of anomaly, but an issue nonetheless, will impact Missourians. If there's things that can be done uh, at the at the department level to help each. Burden, and I certainly think that that's something the Department of Revenue needs to look at. Uh, but then also, obviously, being mindful of the impact on the budget. So we're, we we have to take uh, a, a somewhat cautious view uh, until we understand the full view of and the full uh, kind of reality as to whether or not this hole is going to get filled. Everybody that that we're talking to says it will. I mean, they feel still feel uh, confident. People who watch it a lot closer than 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 we do, kind of the, at, at the macro level, but. 
Um, but so we are where we are and, and we're looking ahead. And I think it's if 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 that process ends up being um, what we think it'll be, then I think it'll be a, a relatively normal uh, budget year uh, in, in Missouri. I'm going to play two clips back to back of kind of competing opinions about the budget year. The first is from State Representative Kip Kendrick. Like you, he's from Columbia. Not yep. like you, he's a Democrat, but he's on the House Budget Committee. Republicans and Democrats on the budgeting committee were disciplined. We will produce a balanced budget that we think that our revenues are going to grow by. But we have a revenue problem in this state, and it's very real. And budgeting is going to become that much more difficult. So do we have a revenue problem? I know that Republicans really don't like raising taxes in any form or raising fees or bringing in new revenue. But it does seem like the tendency has been over the past few years to just cut taxes over and over and over again. And according to Representative Kendrick, even if this budget year is OK, he foresees like massive problems in the future. What 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 do you say about that? There's never enough money. I mean, we could we could raise taxes and and tax everybody at 100 percent. And there's enough good programs uh, that we are faced with, as he said, budgets are about priorities. I absolutely agree with that. But there's never enough money. And so the reality of Missouri's situation is, is really fairly, it's complex, but it's really fairly, it's fairly simple. Missourians voted for Hancock. Uh, Missourians, we've had a balanced budget uh, amendment for a long, long time. Uh, Missourians have voted down every substantive tax increase that's been on the ballot for the last two decades, and most of them by uh, significant margins. And so the question, I think it is easier for us to ask the question, should we have more or less money? That question, I think, has largely been decided by the people of Missouri. This is a conservative state. I don't think there's really any way, and certainly from a fiscal perspective, I think is a very fiscally conservative state. Uh, they don't want new taxes. They don't want higher taxes. And, and, and I think the idea um, that, that we would uh, make the conversation about that is, is, is a conver- it, it's, it's easier for us to have that conversation, but I think Missourians have spoken. And mm-hmm. so, uh, so now we have to, he's right. Now we talk about priorities and, and, you know, we have 28, $29 billion to spend about, about a third of that is, is the money that we actually have, have the ability to, to impact as, as far as discretionary money goes. And, and we've got to figure out what those priorities are. So that's not a new process. We, we uh, Missourians largely, with a few exceptions, uh, have told us how much money we have uh, based on votes that they have taken both at the, at the uh, candidate votes and issue votes. And so now we are charged with making the tough decisions. And they're not easy decisions, but they are the decisions that are, are in front of us. This is a clip from State Treasurer Scott Fitzpatrick. He was the House Budget Chairman. I guess, what, five weeks ago, six weeks yeah, ago? Yeah, something like that. There's been a lot of uh, shifting people <laughs> in the legislature. This is his view of, of, of the budget situation. So I was looking at uh, kind of year-over-year collection numbers last night. In January, uh, last year was up like 24% over January the previous year because everybody was trying to pay their state income tax early to get because Congress capped the state and local tax deduction. So they were trying to make those payments in 17 so they could claim the deductibility. And so that sh- pushed revenue up really high last January. February was then down like 21% last year. So we'll be, right now we're comparing against like one of the strongest Januaries ever. And next next month we'll be comparing against one of the weakest Februarys ever. So it's, you know, I think it'll be, I think it'll be okay. Do you think his analysis is good, bad, indifferent? What's, what's your take? Well, it's certainly right from what happened in, in last January, last February. I mean, that, the, the, there were a number of things that, kind of a uh, uh, one-time, one-off type impacts that the federal tax bill had on on uh, various aspects of the state budget. Uh, I think we will, he, I think he's, the, the January comparison is absolutely right. I think the February comparison is right. And we'll also, I, I think, you know, DOR and the folks that are watching the, the, the issue overall, we, we will start to see, uh, I think, a trajectory of how how, how much this hole is going to get filled in February. You know, you'll see it some in February, you'll see it more in March. And obviously as you get into April, uh, you'll, you'll really have a full grasp of, of where we're going to be. So, you know, I, I do think it, it, it's not premature for us to talk about, uh, you know, making sure that if, if there are things that we can do to help the people of Missouri, uh, it, it, you know, in these situations where they have uh, tax bills that they, they weren't used to or not prepared for, I think, that's something that can happen at the department level. Uh, they, I think they're well within their ability to, 
uh, grant, uh, you know, have payment plans, waive interest, waive penalties, that sort of thing, uh, if, if there's a, a plan in place. Um, but I do think it's a bit premature for us to speculate as to what the income or what, what the outcome, you know, come end of, of fiscal year in, in, in June is going to be. Uh, I, I think we're a little bit too early and, and I, but we're watching it close because, it, you know, it's, it's the reality of a, of a, of a Hancock balanced budget state. And so we watch it close and, and we, we talk really, really, uh, diligently and, and at great length about what we think the prior priorities are. And we spit out a balanced budget and, uh, and hopefully that, that has a positive impact for the state. So it's been about what three or four? It's been about three weeks since Governor Parson made his state of the state speech. I'm I'm losing track of time. I have a small sounds, child. I think you have a small enough. child. You have a small child too. I do. I have a, I have a three month old. Yeah, yeah we're so. neither. This is the sleep deprived political podca- <laughs> politically speaking podcast. You know, the governor talked about you know increasing funding for workforce development programs. He talked about bonding for bridges. He talked about closing a prison in Cameron and kind of merging a lot of that with another prison. And he talked about uh, criminal justice overhaul. I I got the sense that a lot of those things were generally well received. I think Mm -hmm. since then, there's maybe been a little bit of heartburn about where the money for the bridges are going. Um, But just in general, like, how realistic do you think some of the priorities that the governor put forward are actually going to make it to the finish line come May? Some of them are not overly controversial, like Everybody loves workforce development, and I think that those could probably pass without too much of a problem. I think the whole idea of bonding for transportation and using general revenue to pay off that debt, uh, maybe a little bit more controversial. So mm-hmm. what, what's kind of your overall sense of the governor's agenda right now? I've always said, you know, what is refreshing about Governor Parson, uh, and he's proven this, even in his short uh, what eight or nine I don't know how long he's been there eight or nine months maybe uh, that tenure you know, he's proven that um, he, he's just coming at this a little bit differently I mean I think he, he, he largely certainly he had some ambition he ran for lieutenant governor was in that governor's race at one point but I think he uh, he is operating in in a different manner than what you see folks generally in that office and I think that allows him to take on some of these issues, infrastructure and workforce development being the, prime, the, the, the top two that aren't, uh, aren't necessarily the sexiest. They don't, they don't uh, maybe, uh, you know, move a lot of votes when you put them on a push piece for reelection, uh, but, but they are of tremendous importance to the state. And so, you know, you, you applaud, and I think people who uh, have some issues with uh, the the makeup of, of the bridges on on this particular uh, proposal, uh, I think even those folks would applaud him for uh, you know kind of the proactivity in trying to address this issue. The the uh, you know the bonding thing's a tough deal. We 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 did a bonding package in 2014 for higher ed and and you know capital improvements and some of those things, and then that's never an easy lift. Uh, I, I think the, the the pros for the for the program certainly are the fact that. Uh, you know, the, these smaller projects, uh, many of which are in rural, more are which in rural Missouri, um, are a part of the STIP. The STIP being uh, the the transportation plan that MoDOT puts in place at, at, at the uh, Council of Local Regional, uh, Regional Planning Commission. So these are local folks that come together and uh, identify projects of importance uh, as far as transportation infrastructure goes for their community. And that's how the process works. And so... Um, you know, you, you, you are going to have a number of those projects uh, that are taken care of if this were to pass by that $350 million. And so the next, the next $350 million worth of uh, projects, many of which aren't bridge-related but are certainly, you know, road-related, road kind of come up. And so they, they, they boost up in the system because we're taking $350 million out. And so that, I think that's a benefit because you're talking about – you know, potentially at least uh, you're talking about, you know, $700 million worth of investment. At most, I think you're up near a billion because I think there's the potential for more uh, federal investment that could be harnessed because of the fact that we uh, are, are doing things in this way. I think even uh, something that's relevant to, to my folks in, in mid-Missouri is uh, potentially an opportunity uh, to, to reclassify and and apply for some 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 additional funds for the Roachport Bridge which was in the news 
uh, a, a few weeks ago, Patrick McKenna, the director of MoDOT, said, you, you know, if, if we don't find some different solution for that, that there could be eight hour waits uh, on, on I-70, which certainly is unacceptable and I think is not going to happen. Uh, but we've got to help make sure that doesn't happen. So all of these, th- these are all good things. There is some pushback, you know, as far as the, the projects that are on the initial proposal. Uh, we'll have a conversation about that. We have a conversation about all this stuff. But I do think it's it, we are in a bit of a uh, a little bit of a box uh, because of the fact that these are projects that are on the stip. Uh, these are, you know, pre-existing, locally approved type of projects that, that uh, I think – uh, rise to the top be, because of those variables and because it kind of went through the process. And so, uh, you know, we're going to have a robust conversation. I, I, I think it's got as good a chance of passing as it doesn't, but there's, there's uh, you know, a lot of uh, roads left to go down before we get there. That's a great pun, by the way. Did you do that on purpose? <laughs> no, I'm just tired. So we're we're all worked we're out. <laughs> you know, one of the things the governor alluded to in the speech but didn't spend a lot of time on was making changes to the low-income housing tax credit. And mm-hmm. he talked with me pretty extensively about this. And for background, and, and many people of the show know this, the governor is a big supporter of that program. He was actually the one of the few people that actually voted against freezing it, I think, in 2017, along with then-treasurer Eric Schmidt. Mm-hmm. So his views on this are, are very well known. They're not a secret. But he has said he is not going to restart this program unless the legislature makes changes to it. So I think the question is, like, what will the quote unquote reform look like? There's two separate bills that are going through the Senate r- right now. One is from Senator Dan Hageman of Cosby, which cuts the low income housing tax credit by a pretty substantial amount. When he was on the show last year, he basically said that that was a starting point to get to kind of a middle ground. I don't think mm-hmm. that I don't think what the number in his bill is going to be the final number, but I think he wants to get the ball rolling. Recently, sure. I've seen that Senator Bill Eigel has also put forward a bill that cuts uh, LIHTC by a pretty small amount, I think like $10 million or something like that. So my question is, and given the political realities of this, like there's no question that this tax incentive has done a lot of good. It's created a lot of high quality housing throughout the state, but there is a perception that it's essentially corporate welfare for a bunch of politically connected developers and syndicators and and attorneys. Mm -hmm. Um, which one of those approaches do you see gaining traction? The, the Hageman approach, the IGO approach, or maybe something in the middle? Yeah, so I think so. Uh, Senator Hageman's bill actually passed out of committee uh, today, uh, and, and the, uh, the cap was raised to 70%. So uh, that's 70% of the federal credit. So uh, the federal credit's somewhere around $160 million, uh, You know, So you're, you're looking at $115 million or so. Uh, so, so a sizable, still a sizable, I think you're, you're looking at uh, over the course of 10 years, which is kind of how you look at these credits because of the, h- how their lifespan works. I mean, you're looking at half a billion dollars in savings uh, if that bill were to pass, you know, pass through the process unchanged. Uh, I think that I would assume that, that, that if a final outcome exists and if we get a bill across the finish line, it probably is somewhere in that space uh, that that you know I think that I think the haircut from from a cap uh, perspective has to be sizable enough that folks who don't love the program uh, can can claim victory and, and see that there's you know a tangible a tangible change to the program and, and how those dollars are being uh, allocated. Uh, you know you're right that it is a, I, I I've been a supporter. I think it's a good program. Uh, not not because. Uh, contrary to what uh, I think maybe the narrative is out there, like you alluded to, that we're just trying to put money in developers' pockets. But, I mean, I see it in Columbia, uh, in, in, in mid-Missouri, um, you know, the Columbia Housing Authority and projects that they do um, and, and other projects that, that uh, no, nobody's making any money off of, but it's doing a lot of good uh, for folks who really need affordable, quality housing to get get their uh, feet back underneath them to go find a job and, and, and begin the process of making money and paying taxes and the things that we all want, want uh, you know, kind of a, as a part of this process. So uh, I, I get the other, uh, I get the argument on the other side. My only, you know, pushback and my only uh, challenge to folks has always been, we've got a lot of tax credits in Missouri, uh, and, and I think most people would say we have too many. Um, and I would agree with that assertion, but we have to be thoughtful enough 
uh, to be able to differentiate between the the, the, the good ones and, and the not good ones uh, and and, and kind of have that discussion uh, in, in a in a thoughtful way as opposed to well they're all good or they're all bad you know and that that's kind of been that, that's uh, less I think less of a, a challenge than it was maybe when I was in the house um, but still a challenge and so I you know we we, we, won't, we won't find total agreement on the issue I think uh, but let's be thoughtful about it and make sure that you know if, if there's a world in which we need to uh, restart this program because uh, we are all even you know they're they're free market folks all across this building um but there are some things that that uh without a, a little boost from somewhere the, the the market might not be able to take care of because the, these housing projects in a lot of way in a lot of cases are not profitable and so when you're talking about uh folks who are in in the business of making profit and we are asking them to to uh, undertake a a a necessary uh, but maybe not profitable uh, uh, objective of, of low income affordable housing. Um, there's there's got to be a boost there, or in some cases it just won't happen. And and I think there's a lot of folks who suffer if that if that's the case. I'm gonna play a clip now from one of your colleagues, Senator Eric Burleson. He's from Republican from Greene County. You served with him in the House. I asked him kind of what his prognosis was for getting anything passed because we've been talking about this issue for almost a decade of tax mm-hmm. credits and low-income housing tax credits and there's often a lot of talk but not a lot of action this is what senator burleson told me in december you can create an environment where government is picking the company and and without enough restraints that company is going to make uh, egregious profits and i'm a, to me it makes the, it really is an embarrassment for the private sector um, and for for free market capitalism i want to see a solution that um, is is low cost to the taxpayers but effective and clearly the i think the reason why governor parson is rightly hitting the pause button is that when you look at all of the data and the reports that came out is that we're not getting the bang for the buck when that with that program and so um, I'm I'm willing to take a look at it and see what solu- what solutions that people have, um, but I but I I'm like you I think having had some history in the building I think it's likely that we won't see anything. So my observation is I I, I understand what the governor was trying to do with his declaration that he wasn't going to restart the program until something was done, and I think that he is probably has more positive leverage than say. Governor Greitens did when he froze Mm -hmm. this and caused people Mm -hmm. to be very upset um, about that. But it does kind of put him in a box. And if people really don't like the final product and they feel that it's kind of sham reform, they could just filibuster it. it, Nothing passes. And then the governor is pretty much trapped in his own words of not being able to restart the program. Do you feel like that there's any threat of that actually occurring or is there general consensus that the people want to see this program restarted and they're not going to let the perfect be the enemy of the good? Well, I, you know, I think we are in a different fundamentally in a different spot as far as what is being asked of us, because in years past, the, the program has existed. The state credit has existed. And uh, I think the industry has been able that their only objective to, to keep the status quo was to was to kill a bill. Right. And so that in this building, killing a bill is infinitely easier uh, than, than passing a bill. And so uh, I think now because of the actions uh, last year with Governor Greitens and, and uh, the, the commission, uh, now the industry, the folks who who, who carry these these uh, projects out. Uh, they, they need a bill, right? And so I think we are in a different, it has created a different conversation. And I think the conversation is, is, has gone very well up until this point. Uh, the, the, like I said, the bill is out of, the commi- out of committee. I think it'll be on the floor in the next few weeks. Um, and, and, you know, can I speculate as to whether or not Senator Burleson, who's, who's a good friend and, and, and is going to be a great senator, or any of the other folks who who maybe share a similar opinion, what exactly what they're going to do, I don't know. But I, I do think Senator Hageman, I know him well enough, and I know kind of his view of he he handled the historic preservation uh, reform bill last year, uh, and I think was was very thoughtful and and uh, diplomatic in how he handled that process, and and we came to an outcome that was I think was substantive in in its reform 
um, uh, and, and got actually a lot of folks, I think, who would fall into Senator Burleson's camp, uh, who are, are generally skeptical of these programs. Uh, I think it got a fair amount of them to vote for it, and, and certainly in the House. So, so I think we're, we're in a much better place than we've been in the past, but, but I think Senator Burleson's right in that there's a, a few other uh, barriers that we've got to, to, to jump over before we get over the finish line. But I, I do think if, if we pass a bill, um, I, I can say with some degree of certainty, having been in a number of these conversations, that it, it's not going to be a sham. I mean, it's going to be something that I think not only will, will lower the cap somewhat substantively, uh, but we'll also, I think, do some other things that uh, that some some will be able to do. And I think some I think Governor Parson, uh, should a state credit come back online, I think there's some things that he can do uh, through through uh, MHTC and, uh, that that would be helpful and that would allow for the program to operate more effectively and more efficiently um, than maybe it has in the past. So now we've come to the part of the show that both the senator and I agree is the most fun part of the show. And that is discussion <laughs> about how uh, legislators are going to deal with Amendment 1, which is uh, known as clean Missouri, but it's part of the Missouri Constitution now. Let's start on the Sunshine Law. And and I've, I've said this on other shows. I don't think this is an issue that journalists are um, uninterested in or even unbiased about. I think that generally journalists tend to be pretty strong advocates for being able to get information from governmental officials. And I'm just going to repeat the same statement that I've said to everybody. I understand kind of the the rhetoric that's being uh, talked about, like in the House and Senate, about constituent private information. And I I don't have any interest in emailing or sunshining your emails and and getting like correspondence from citizen A in Roachport to to your office. Like there's Mm -hmm. no real news value in that for me. If you all passed a bill closing those, I would not care. The thing that I've had a little bit more concern about is, you know, especially in the House, but when we were talking with Senator Schatz, too, is there seems to be a push about closing uh, communications related to legislative proceedings or legislative strategy, which I've heard various things about uh, and reasoning, uh, one of which which I'm going to play right now from House Speaker Elijah Har as an example. One of the duties of the speaker is to appoint committee members and committee chairs. Uh, a lot of times I, I may want to discuss with my my chief of staff, okay, I'm trying to decide between th- these two or three candidates for a particular chairmanship. Which one do you think is the best and why? Well, if the, if the chief of staff tries to explain why one is best, they're also saying why the other one is not as good. If, if that gets sunshine, obviously you're going to have then a caucus being like, well, why, why did you say I wasn't, you know, smart about this, or why did you say I wasn't talented enough for this? And it it it, it causes real problems. So you, it is very difficult to have those candid conversations about making decisions within the within our caucus, within the House, within the the processes we follow. So I guess the basic question is, what do you think the legislature is actually going to restrict? Because I, I I think that there's no question that the legislature has the power to restrict emails even after Amendment 1 passed. I don't even think clean Missouri people would say it's unrestricted. I think that the concern among people that voted for clean Missouri and journalists is that you're going to restrict it so much that you're it's basically going to revert back to where it was before Amendment 1 passed where you can basically get nothing. So what's what's the lay of the land? Well, it's a it is a it it is a tough question. I I think the the um, the House took some action yesterday, and we're still getting familiar with what that exactly what that did. Uh, but I think the uh, my goal, and this is me speaking, and and certainly I, I think the the twenty four members of my caucus and the, the the folks on the other side probably have um, maybe some some similar opinions and certainly some different ones. But I mean, my goal is 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 to find the right balance. I, I think it's clear, and I I'm someone who has advocated on some level for. Uh, for uh, our records to be sunshineable, uh, and and I think that there's in in the right with the right balance and with the right parameters, that is more than appropriate. Uh, and I, so I don't have any problem there. I don't think we have any business and 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 should go try to revert this thing all the way back to where it was. I, I think uh, I think that would be a bit of a, a a disservice and an injustice to the to the folks who voted for clean Missouri. And and even though I wasn't supportive for for different reasons. Uh, certainly a, a, a number of Missourians were. 
so, you know, I think we do have to find the balance. There's various aspects of communication and there's, there's different, uh, interactions that we have with different people. I think the, you know, the constituent interaction as you, that you alluded to, uh, I think is, is something that is, uh, worrisome to us because I think we've had, I, for me personally, I've got six, six years, um, uh, going on six and, and some change worth of interactions with constituents, um, that, that some of which has been, uh, you know, highly personal, uh, and, and, and those are things that we, we want to be made aware of. I mean, I think the other thing, and I don't, I'm not sure that they, uh, I, I haven't asked the question, but I think it was a post dispatch that, um, just out of the clear blue sky, uh, uh sunshined at Emory who, who has a bill that would make some changes here, uh, sunshined, um, his, his emails and just, posted two names uh, and, and the names and cities of two of his constituents and, and two opinions that they had about um, particular bills. Um, I thought that was somewhat irresponsible um, just because there was no, there was no real purpose there uh, other than just kind of to do it. And so if anything, I think it gave us <laughs> a little bit of leverage uh, and ammunition to, to speculate as to why maybe something needs to be changed. But at the end of the day, we, we do have to find the right balance. I hope we find the right balance. I hope we don't, and, and we won't be able to. I think there will be enough people who would stand up and say, hey, we're not, if, if we're swinging the pendulum back too far the other way, certainly in the Senate uh, because of, of, of how we do things over here, I think you'd have a number of people who would stand up and, and, and talk at great length about how, why that isn't appropriate. So yeah. I think if we find a, if, if we find a solution, it's going to be one that I, I think is going to have to have some consensus and, and we're going to be able to communicate uh, why that is to constituents and also the, you know, Democrats and Republicans who may have some, some concerns. You were, you alluded to the, the house debate, which happened on Monday. And yep. again, and that, that, that was an amendment that passed on to another bill. It, it, the, the thing that I think I was alluding to before is it would restrict any document or record, including electronic communications received, repaired by or on behalf of a member of a public governmental body consisting of advice, opinions and recommendations in connection with the deliberate decision making process of said body. So is that one sentence? I think so. That's a, that's a heck of a sentence. But let me just put a <laughs> scenario forward. We were talking about the low income housing tax credit. A few minutes ago, if I wanted to sunshine all of Senator Hageman's emails and all of Senator mm -hmm. Eigel's emails and seeing if anybody pro or con were communicating with them about that bill, do you think that type of language would make it so I couldn't get that Im information? I don't think that's nearly as sensitive, for example, as 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 like constituent communication. And I think that that should be open and I should be able no, to obtain those right. things. I think the, you know, there, there are distinctions certainly between uh, constituent communication and, uh, you know, communication with lobbyists or uh, stakeholders or folks that are advocating uh, for or against. I have Mike Bernsketter and I and a few others have an interesting little uh, anomaly in that there are a bunch of lobbyists who are my constituents who live in Columbia. So yeah. we're trying to figure out a, a world in which we pass something, how we make sure that. I, I mean, uh, th I, that definitely crossed my mind that, you it's know. An it, yeah, it, it, it's. And look, I mean, I think interactions uh, with lobbyists shouldn't be off limits. Uh, I, I think that's a part of if there if there's anything, certainly that um, I, I think if the people of Missouri knew fully what they were voting for on that sunshine law, I think it would have, it, it would be, I don't know where it would have landed, uh, but if there was anything that, that I think folks would really want to know is, Hey, if you're, if you're at, if you're communicating with special interests and folks who are uh, sometimes getting paid to advocate for something, sometimes who are doing it just because they're passionate about it, um, that, that, you know, that should be public record. I, I don't, I don't disagree with that. Um, but, but I also think that, that there are, uh, the, the devil is in the details on all this stuff. And what I've told everybody who has, you know, people who have emailed me and said, hey, we, you know, um, we want the will of the people to stand here. I, I get that. I understand that. But I think my, my par part of my concern and part of why I think there are some things that we should do is I, I don't believe that the, the parts of clean Missouri outside of the redistricting uh, component were particularly well done. I think that there were a lot of things that, that were left to be uh, entirely too vague. Uh, there were references that were not entirely correct. Uh, and so I, I think e even if there are some things that we do, my goal is to is to fix them uh, so that they are being done properly uh, and so that we don't we don't uh, bring the, these 
gotcha moments in into uh, into the equation simply because something was poorly written. And so that that's what I and we're working with the ethics commission uh, and other interested parties to say, hey, if we do do something, at least on our side, I can't speak for what the House has done and who who consulted on that uh, language, but. On our side, I think we know what we want to accomplish, uh, and, and I think we want to make sure that if we do it, that we do it in the right way. Um, but I don't have any I don't have any interest in, in in swinging the pendulum way back to where it was because I I think that I think that particular uh, uh, action would be yeah would be I think a disservice to voters. Well, let's talk about the redistricting part of Clean Missouri because I think that's where mo- I mean the sunshine part I think definitely is a source of tension. The redistricting sure. part, I think, is kind of the main tension behind Amendment all 1. Out, you, call, you, war, yeah. <laughs> you called it terrible policy. Why, why do you think that the, 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 the new redistricting system is terrible policy, especially compared to the old one, which I could point out a number of deficiencies to? But why sure. do you think it's yeah. bad, basically? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think a statement of, of negativity towards the, the, the new system is, is a complete and roaring uh, endorsement of the old one. But... Uh, I, I do think, number one, you know, I, I'm not sure that you can say um, uh, it would be I, I think anybody who knows the two systems and know the two, knows the two processes uh, would, would be able to say that that uh, we are any less uh, susceptible to gerrymandering under the new proposal than we were in the old one. In fact, I, I would say that the exact opposite is true, because there, there is no scenario. I mean, I'm telling you, we've we've done a mountain of research. Um, and have had people draw. I mean, I've seen a, a dozen, probably 20 maps. Uh, there is no scenario in which this demographer is going to be able to do what is proposed in clean Missouri uh, without it being challenged and I think being thrown out uh, because the, the, the reality of Missouri is is what it is. We are a conservative state. Uh, the, the rural portions of Missouri uh, are as conservative as they have ever been, and I don't think that changes anytime soon. Uh, you've seen Jefferson County uh, go from, you know, always, uh, well, uh, uh, Democratic stronghold to, uh, you know, Paul Whelan won by 20 points. And, and I think every uh, county official, for the most part, is Republican. I think you've seen some areas south of that, St. Genevieve, and some of those areas that pr- typically kind of blue collar, uh, blue dog Democrat, those folks love Donald Trump and, and, and they're not they're not voting for anybody but Republicans these days. And so the idea that we can create artificially uh, by by uh, giving this demographer, uh, you know, some some objective or set of objectives, create a a fifty fifty balance in the state of Missouri is just it's it's impossible. And so the only way to do it uh, is to gerrymander. I mean, honest to God, the only way that, that this demographer, whoever that person ends up being, uh, can can try to uh, get these objectives is to absolutely one hundred percent gerrymander by every sense of the definition. And so uh, I think we 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 are we are aware of uh, I think the the the, the what the voters uh, thought that they were voting for uh, as it relates to to um, redistricting. I think many voters certainly um, I think if you would have given them, given them the full breadth of information and certainly in rural Missouri um, would would have had a much different view of of this issue were it not for. Uh, the lobbyist gift cap and and the two year revolving door and and kind of the the um, candy that they they put in with clean Missouri, uh, but look, I mean we we, we want to I I think we are going to talk about this issue. I I'd like to come up with and hopefully maybe find a uh, an alternative proposal. But the reality is it's going to go back to the voters and so the people who have have emailed me or or called me and said hey. We we already voted for this once. I say, look, you're going to vote for it again if 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 we find something that we think better accomplishes the objectives, without giving one person um, the license to gerrymander and giving an office in the state auditor who who typically is 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 supposed to be, um, you know, the the, the most a partisan nonpartisan office, and we we just saddle that person uh, right now. It's Auditor Galloway with with this immense responsibility and and very political. Uh, you know, I just think it's irresponsible. And so it, it is bad policy. Um, but uh, it, we I understand that that uh, the people of Missouri voted for it. And so if, if we are going to come up with a better solution, 
we're going to have those conversations. We're going to pass it out of this chamber, and the people of Missouri are going to get the final say one more time. And that was going to be my, my follow-up question to it, because we can go back and forth about whether the new system is good or bad and for another sure. 50 minutes. But I, I feel yep. like you know there's been a lot of this on this show. I, I think that this is the big problem for people that don't like this, is the fact that this is in the Constitution, that when you put it up for a revote in 2020, which I think is going to happen, you all have the votes. I think some Democrats are going to join you. Um, so I don't really think it's, it's very suspenseful. You, you obviously yeah. can do this. The question is, what's it going to look like and how are you going to craft it in a way that's not just going to be voted down by 60 or 70 percent? Because I think a, a, a rightful question that voters will ask themselves, especially once the opposite side of this spend the resources and the messaging to combat this is like, hey, we already voted on this. Understand that there was a lot of stuff around it, but why should we get rid of something that we already voted for? So that's kind of a verbose way of saying, like, A, do you think this is going to pass this year or next year? And B, what is this going to look like? Is it just going to be a straight up on the redistricting plan or is it going to be redistricting with a lot of other things around it similar to what the Clean Missouri proposal was? Yeah, I I, I don't know which year it passes. Uh, I mean, I, I. If I had to, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, we, we've had a number of conversations within our caucus. Uh, you know, I, I think there is universal uh, support uh, am- amongst our side uh, to, to do something that it, it rises to the level. And the reason why it rises to the level is, is this is a, you know, this is a generational sort of change uh, that, that, that we think ha- has a negative impact um, uh, on, on rural Missouri, I think has a negative impact in, in, in some cases, uh, on, on majority minority districts is the reason why some African-American Democrats came out uh, against it, because I think they understand the reality of it because they, they, they live in this world and, and certainly they, they don't want to see, um, their, their, um, ability to, to have a voice down here diminished in any way. And so uh, it, it rises to that level. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a tough when, when, a, when the voters pass something and we send them something else that is in uh, in response to it, you know, two years later, uh, uh, certainly that, that there is a message there that we have to deal with. Um, but, you know, I think it's as important as um, uh, really anything else that we're going to do because it's, it is, it is a part of the integrity of, of the process of, of having these elections. And, and, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I, I get it. I understand why the folks that, that push clean Missouri push it because, you know, Missouri is, is moved increasingly to the right. I mean, don't look any further than, than central Missouri in my district where, you know, Columbia has effectively stayed, that hasn't moved to the left because Columbia is growing and, and the, the way that it is growing is with new jobs uh, and people that are moving in that aren't kind of the born and bred uh, liberal that you've come to to, to uh, recognize with Columbia. But out County Boone uh, and Cooper County are as conservative as they've ever been. And so the only way um, that that uh, uh, Democrats and, and folks who push this issue uh, saw that they were that their, their party's not moving anywhere near the center. Obviously, you've seen the, the abortion uh, debacle that they, uh, just the, the travesty that has gone on in New York, I think has, has further uh, heightened the reality um, that the Republican Party is absolutely in control of, of Missouri and will be for a long time, but because our values are more in line with the, with the people of Missouri. So all of that to say um, that there's only one way to fix this problem, and that's the gerrymander. That's the only way that the, the, the that the folks who push clean Missouri, I think, realize that, that there's only what one way that they can find a way um, to to uh, strengthen their their position uh, in the General Assembly. And this is the way to do it. So I understand why it's important to them. I understand why they spent, uh, you know, the money that they did and why traditional liberal interest groups like Planned Parenthood and, and the NEA and others, why they were a part of this. I get it. It makes perfect sense. And the way that they did it was genius. I got no problems with that. But it's bigger than politics because this this is going to outlive, uh, you know, my tenure in the Senate. I'm gone in, in, in six years or two years whenever the, the voters decide to, to send me home. Um, but but this is something that I think is important for the next, you know, 20 or 30 elections. And so that's why I think it's going to take up some bandwidth. And I think it's it's the reason why it needs to take up some bandwidth. For all of our stories, stlpublicradio.org. Follow me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. How would people follow you on Twitter or any other part of the World Wide Web, Senator? 
uh, at Caleb Rowden. Thank you very much. Until next time, so long. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. Mm -hmm.